chapter 9, part 2, we left off at mastectomy um, as part of our pre-analytical. Um, I want you to view 293, your clinical alert, being aware that venipuncture shouldn't be performed on the site of a mastectomy, and the physician should always be involved in determining a suitable site. We won't make those calls because we don't know what type of lymph nodes the patient had removed. Um, this also includes finger sticks, um, tourniquet tying, blood pressure as well. Lymphedemous limbs should be protected from cut, scratch, burns, and um, blood collection because like we talked about in Chapter 7, taking out those lymph nodes leaves that lymph fluid is potentially stagnant, which could cause a, an infection. And I'll show um, images of what lymphedema looks like. Edema is swelling that can be localized or diffused over a larger part of the body. Veins in these areas are difficult to palpate or locate, and the specimen may become contaminated with the fluid, so we try to avoid collecting in those arms. Menstrual cycle um, is the single most common cause of iron deficiency anemia in women, so we do not collect more blood than is absolutely necessary so as not to increase um, negative effects of additional blood loss during venipuncture. The fact reinforces the issue that healthcare workers need to be careful not to collect more blood. Um, and the average blood loss ranges from 44 to 80 milliliters, but may be lessened if the patient is using um, oral contraceptives. Medications. Blood being collected to determine levels of medication should in most cases be collected just prior to the next dose. Hundreds of medications are available, each of which have a particular pharmaceutical kinetics. Um, so on your book on 294, some drugs taken orally reach maximum effective serum concentration slower than by an IV. So those are things we need to have kind of knowledge and communication with the healthcare providers, nurses, pharmacy, um, to determine when to collect those specimens to give us the best range for that patient. Many prescription drugs can interfere with clinical laboratory determinations or can psychologically alter the levels of blood constitutes measures in the clinical laboratories, so those are special things we got to take into consideration. Um, I want you to reference the box 9-3. talks about different types of drug interferences, just so you can kind of understand this a little bit more. We're going to go on to infections. Many patients have transmittable diseases, such as hepatitis, that can be passed from one patient to another. We want to avoid touching the site for blood collection after the site has been cleaned. And blood collection equipment should not be opened prior to the time of collection. We normally, generally, will open our equipment on a blood protective mat in front of the patient, not prior to the patient sitting down. Vomiting. Um, have the patient take deep breaths and use cold compress on his or her head. Inform the patient's physician or nurse if this complication happens. Being aware that not allowing the patient to have anything to eat or drink post-vomiting because it might instigate it again. Other factors affecting the patient, gender and pregnancy, age, geographical factors, and the weather. I'm going to go back to the um, slide on vomiting real quick. Just because I wanted to reference, so an example, um, glucose tolerance test is one that if the patient vomits within the first 30 minutes of drinking the glucola drink, we would have to be advised to reschedule that patient. If it was after 30 minutes, then we might be able to move forward. So that's just an example of how vomiting could impact. We want the glucose to be start metabolizing. If it hasn't yet, then the test wouldn't be accurate. Identification discrepancies. Improper identification um, is the most dangerous and costly error a healthcare worker can make. Loss of life from acute um, hemorrhagic transfusion reaction, delayed diagnosis, additional blood collection, laboratory testing, and treatment of the wrong patient for the wrong disease. Um, the Joint Commission is improving the accuracy of patient identification through at least two unique identifiers, one of which cannot be the patient's location, so i.e. room number, 
when we go to ID the patient, we're not using um, bed labels, water pitchers, or door charts. To have identification, it needs to be an armband that is present on our patient's body. If there's any conflicting information on that armband, we are not to draw the patient until the armband is corrected. If we find a discrepancy in the requisition and the name and how the sta patient states it verbally, we would report it to the supervisor and nurse in order to prevent any errors related to that patient as well. So an example of this would be when we had two patients in a room together, there was a patient, bed A, bed B, both had the same first name, same last name, different birthdays, and one had kidney failure, the other did not, and the technician mixed up the identification, and therefore the patient who had kidney failure looked like they recovered. The patient who was fine looked like they were going into kidney failure, and in those circumstances, sometimes our lab will not catch that. So then it's on the phlebotomist. So it's a three-way identification. We're going to check our requisition, we're going to check our ambient, and then we're also going to get a verbal from the patient as well. Oh, we're having a glitch with the slide. Hang on one second. So again, the number one priority for the Joint Commission is through at least two unique identifiers, one of which cannot be the patient's location, which I talked about just previously. We're going to refer to Chapter 10 for more details on patient identification procedures, and this is going to be covered again in our specimen processing um, laboratory PowerPoint, which I'll provide later on. Time of collection. So generally, early morning specimens commonly requested in the hospital settings be because a fasting specimen is preferred. The healthcare worker is running late. The specimen might be collected after the inpatient has eaten breakfast and will require a special notation about a non-fasting condition. Requisitions. Checking the requisition to match the laboratory test requested with appropriate type of blood collection tube is essential to minimize the amount of blood collected for each patient. So for example, we might get a requisition that has a complete blood count and a hemoglobin. We wouldn't draw two tubes because the hemoglobin is already present inside of the complete blood count, so that might help us minimize the amount of tubes we draw. Tourniquet pressure and fist pumping. Laboratory test results can be falsely elevated or decreased if the tourniquet pressure is too tight or maintained too long. We want to be mindful that the tourniquet is on for no longer than one minute. Pressure from the tourniquet causes biological anions to leak it from the tissue cells into the blood or vice versa. For example, plasma, cholesterol, Iron, lipid, protein, and potassium levels will be falsely elevated if the tourniquet pressure is too tight or prolonged. Significant elevation may be seen as short as three minutes um, application of the tourniquet. So being mindful of that. Also, too, um, some enzymes, pumping of the fist before venipuncture, so this is, would be opening and closing the hand repeatedly should be avoided because it leads to an increase in the plasma's potassium, lactate, and phosphate concentrates. We instruct our patient to make a fist and hold it, and that's what we need to continue with proceeding forward. Figure 9 slash 2 is going to cover several factors that may cause a healthcare worker to miss a vein. These factors include not inserting the needle deep enough, inserting the needle all the way through the wall, so I'm going to go over each image in just a second. So image A is accurate blood flow. We're into the middle of the vein. No concerns. B would be caused by us being up against the vein wall, and we're actually lifting the needle, which is lifting the skin, which would block the bevel from getting blood flow. Image C has the needle going through, and we're at the back of the wall almost through it. So we wouldn't get a blood flow because, again, the bevel's being blocked. D is where the technician went too high of a degree and went all the way through the vein. Again, we wouldn't get blood flow from this, and the patient might actually say something hurts. We could end up hitting an artery or nerve at that point. E, we went in and we're barely beveling. We kind of nicked the vein. So the blood needs somewhere to go, so it's going to bubble up here into a blood leakage. B or F, sorry, F is an example of a collapsed vein. As we see here, 
the needles inserted and this vein starts changing in size. This would be a collapsed vein that wouldn't give us any um, blood flow and it's not something that we would keep probing around. Um, we'd have to discontinue the draw. G is an example of, again, something very similar to E, except you went through, all the way through the walls and now you got blood leakage under, so this would cause a bruise on the underside of the patient's arm. And H is the needle has barely went through the top layer of skin. So obviously we're not going to get a blood flow in this circumstance because we're not even in the vessel wall okay, of the vein. Image 9-2 is also in your textbook on 297 with detailed um, descriptions of each and how to either correct or not correct. In most circumstances, we'd have to discontinue the procedure and try again. Um, the only one that could possibly be looked at and be saved is this one here where we're against the vein wall. We're not through it. We could back the needle out and get our return. And this one, we could just advance the needle a little farther. Um, but when we have any type of blood leakage collapsing or we're through the vein, we do need to discontinue that procedure. Factors that may cause healthcare worker to miss the vein, not inserting the needle deep enough, inserting the needle all the way through the vein, holding the needle bevel against the vein wall or losing the vacuum in the tube, which is commonly seen if the tube was depressed into the needle before the needle was inserted into the patient's arm or the tube was expired. Defective tubes, on an occasion a test tube will have no vacuum because of manufacturer error, age of the tube or a tube leakage after a venipuncture. Needles for evacuated tube systems have been known to unscrew from the barrel during venipuncture, so making sure all our equipment is well taken care of prior to collecting. If this happens, this tourniquet should re be released immediately and the needles removed. Again, we're allowed two attempts to stick a patient. Backflow of anticoagulant, the patient's arm is placed in a downward position and the tube top in the utmost position to avoid risk of backflow of the anticoagulant from blood vacuum tube into the patient's circulation. Some of our tubes have a liquid um, anticoagulant in it. So for hospital patients unable to extend his or her arm, we're going to raise the head of the bed to make sure that this anticoagulant doesn't adversely go back into our patient arm. Fainting or syncope. Syncope is a transition and frequent sudden loss of consciousness due to lack of oxygen to the brain. This results in the ability to stay in an upright position. Prior to collecting a patient's blood, we will actually ask the patient if they've been drawn before and if so, how did it go? That gives us a lot of information on how their last blood draw went and without instigating the um, term of fainting. So that way we can have them laid down if they did have a history of fainting. Syncope caused by, or caused by a variety of factors, hypoglycemia, hyperventilation, cardiac, um, neurological, physiological conditions, and medication. Please make sure to reference page 298 and 299 on this topic as well, as well as the clinical alert um, about hematoma formation. I'm going to pause the PowerPoint here. I want you to review and look over the chapter portion on 298 and 299 and fainting and syncope. And we'll continue chapter 9, part 3 um, in just a couple minutes. So please view that PowerPoint to continue with this slideshow.